My name is Annie Holmes. I work with the STRIVE Research Consortium based at the London School of Hygiene and Medicine. And we're a multi-country consortium with partners in South Africa, Tanzania, India, Uganda, and associates in other countries. Today we're really um, glad to have a colleague from a partner research, con research consortium, the What Works Consortium, which um, Erin will explain. Erin has quite considerable experience in, the, in implementation research and particularly in the prevention of gender-based violence and HIV AIDS and sexual and reproductive health. You can see on the invitation a range of organizations she's worked with and we're now lucky to have her at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's going to speak to you about Indashakira, a really interesting um, case study of, a, of prevent IPV based in Rwanda. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Annie, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I just want to firstly also highlight um, the program partners involved in Indashakira. As Annie mentioned, I'm working with the Wet Work Prevent Violence Initiative at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, the Indashakira implementing program partners are CARE International Rwanda and two Rwandan NGOs, Rwandan Men's Resource Center, RAMREC, and Rwanda Women's Network. So today I really wanted to focus on, you know, adaptation of programs and what we've been learning about the experience of adapting in Dashikura in Rwanda. Um, as we know, in the field of gender-based violence and other fields, including HIV, programs that have been piloted and proven there's an urgent need to adapt these to other contexts, and uh, particularly, and also for scale up as well. Um, and one of our key kind of, I think, questions of interest is how do we re-implement programs that were shown to be effective, but in new contexts, while maintaining core goals and delivery techniques that were really responsible for its effectiveness. As we know, there are often mismatches with the new population. Um, potentially the implementing agency and the original program. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the, in the program proven to be effective that we draw on, the original language, images, examples may be outdated or culturally inappropriate. We may find that original program objectives, approaches, or activities are even controversial or also just irrelevant in a new setting. And we may also find that the organization adapting a program uh, lacks funding, staffing, or even expertise to implement the um, adapted program. So we're really looking at how do we bridge this gap between concepts that have been proven and applying them in new settings. Um, as Annie did mention, this is part of the What Work Prevent Violence Against Women and Girls program. I'm not going to talk about this a lot today, but there is the website, um, www.whatworks.co.za, for those who are interested to know more. Um, but what I do just want to say is that Indashikira is one of the impact evaluations as part of this global consortium, and quite a few of the programs uh, that are being evaluated were also adapted to different settings. Um, so, you know, this question of adaptation is definitely relevant to this global program. Um, in terms of kind of steps for adaptation that we've considered in Indashikira and also drawing on other learnings from the field of adaptation, as we know, it's, a, it's appropriate first to select what has been shown to be effective and what's suitable for the program objectives, um, but then to really think about what were the core components and best practice characteristics. And what we mean by that is, you know, elements that were either shown to be responsible or we believe to be responsible for why an intervention was effective. Um, and then to really gather as much detail and knowledge about the original programs. And I think, you know, these kind of learning and sharing platforms are so important for the field because to, for us to really be able to learn why programs were effective and to have that open access so that other programs can adapt them. And, you know, once you've done that kind of initial understanding of why the program was effective, gathering as much information as you can, 
to really then think about how does that relate to the new context, new potential model and materials that you're hoping to develop for your adaptive program. Um, you may find that your program goals are objectives, although they draw on the original effectiveness, are different. Um, often we find that the characteristics of the population are different. So whether it's within the country or with another country, we still may be targeting a different age group, a different educational background or development level. We might find that there are different cultural beliefs, different norms, different values, different languages in the adapted setting that we need to consider. There also are characteristics of implementing partners that we um, have to consider, such as staff credentials, expertise that might be different from the original program. And, you know, importantly, looking also at just not just the program-specific elements, but characteristics of the community. There might be laws, policies, um, things like even just access to transportation for community members that can implement on the viability of a certain program in a new context. And I think what we're learning with Tendash Akira and also with the field is that we document the process of any of these changes made and these considerations taken into account so that we can learn in the field of adaptation how and why this new program was adapted. It's also important that when the results of an adapted program are disseminated, that how this new program was implemented is really made clear so that for the field and for the learning, we know how and why it's changed from the original adaptation. So, um, you know, some other kinds of questions in terms of that I know were also were useful for Andasha Kira, but um, from the adaptation field is really, again, just looking at uh, when you're developing new materials, new curriculums, and I'll talk about that today, what happened with Andasha Kira, looking at the research information in the program. Is it up to date? Is there new research that needs to be done to inform the programming? Um, are the images and examples up to date and appropriate? Um, and do the training materials reflect the changes that have been made to the program content and how it's being delivered? Um, and also needs to be adapted um, the process and outcome evaluation materials. So sometimes you'll find that you're able to draw on adaptation monitoring tools, but of course these will also have to be adapted for consideration um, to reflect the changes in the program. So that's just a bit of the background. I'm now going to talk about some of the processes of adaptation of Indashikura. Um, Indashikura draws on multiple learnings from the field. One program that it does draw some lessons on that was implemented in Rwanda is called Journeys of Transformation. Um, this essentially grew out of some learning of Care Rwanda assessing the uh, Village Savings and Loans Association, which are microfinance groups set up to primarily economically empower women. Uh, but an assessment found that uh, many of women's husbands, their partners, were controlling the group through the money, and many women felt unconfident to make decisions about a loan without their husband's approval. Uh, Journeys of Transformation was a 16-session curriculum implemented by CARE, Pramundo, and RAMREC. So as you see, many of the partners and in Dashikira, um, but with men, both as couples and in groups, to really support women's economic empowerment and also to look at men's cooperation in household activities and supporting uh, women's access to these you know, microfinance groups. Um, an evaluation did was conducted and found quite positive impact on household collaboration, decision making, partner relations, although an unclean reduction in gender based violence, which was not as strong a focus of the program. Um, and interestingly, which is something that we've built on in Dashikira, is some of the couples trained requested skills and activism to share changes they had learned, changes that benefited their household with fellow community members. So that brings me to my next point about other um, effective programs that informed Indashikura. I'm sure many of you have heard of SASA um, in Uganda, which was found to be a community mobilization, both HIV and IPV prevention program uh, that was found to be very successful, including a 52% reduction in past year physical IPV among women um, as per an evaluation by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and so both, you know, a lot of the industrial cure would just draw on SAS's emphasis on, you know, both negative and positive types of power, um, supporting community members to engage in activism themselves, and also involving stakeholders such as government or service providers to create an enabling environment for the kinds of change learned at more of an individual level. 
Um, and so another program element that feeds into Ambassacura is Rwanda Women's Network's Polyclinics of Hope. Um, these have been supporting both health, psychosocial, socioeconomic needs of survivors of gender-based violence. They've been operating in Rwanda for more than 20 years, and were incorporated into Ambassacura to ensure this enabling environment and that there, you know, as much as it is a prevention-focused intervention, to also ensure that there are appropriate response. Um, support for women experiencing violence. So Industrial Kira is really a blended approach of some of the learnings from SASA, Journeys of Transformation, this Polyclinics of Hope, and came together to create a new program model and accompanying theory of change to support the, the adaptation. Um, I want to highlight a few things that were quite different from particular programs like SASA, which many of you are probably more aware of. Um, so SASA program was mostly implemented within Kampala, within districts around uh, Kampala, but Ndashikirwa is primarily in more rural areas, um, and it's quite widespread across the country. Uh, the districts where implementation is were actually chosen having high rates of intimate partner violence, according to the Demographic Health Survey from 2010, and having a strong presence of care, village and savings and loans associations, um, and part you know, a reason for this was that these CSLAs were still used as a platform, as they were also used as journeys of transformation for a curriculum that was implemented over five months with couples. 840 couples were trained across the country to really support healthy, equal relationships, um, drawing on lessons from both SASA and journeys of transformation. And 25% of those who completed the curriculum were supported to become community activists and engage in community activism activities over the next two years, uh, learning, kind of teaching about the positive relationship changes they had learned through the, this training program. Um, the work of Rwanda Women's Network, as I mentioned, is really looking at the enabling environment for change. And so they implemented a quite two-week more rapid curriculum with opinion leaders, and by this I mean uh, service providers, it could be religious leaders, um, women who are on the National Women's Council, so opinion leaders who have influence within the community. Um, and they're also ongoingly supported by Rwanda Women's Network to support their actions to both prevent and respond to IPV throughout the um, ongoing years. Um, as I mentioned, there's also the women's spaces which have been set up, and these were drawn from women who are living in the communities to support them to run these women's spaces uh, where women can learn about their rights, um, seek support if experiencing violence, and also have accompanying referral if they want to seek further help. Um, and so there was an intensive training with facilitators selected from the community um, to then um, kind of support this work, and they've also been ongoingly supported by Rwanda Women's Network to run the women's spaces. Um, and then as well, you know, all of these phases really lead into ongoing community activism, both by couples, by opinion leaders, by women's spaces that does draw on SASA but has adapted it. Um, and um, as I'll mention today, there's also been quite a lot of additional messages and activities that have been developed for the Rwandan context and that are more um, related to this kind of combined theory of change that was developed. Um, here's just a nice kind of image of the Industrial Cure program, and you can see, you know, works at both um, cell, which is more at the a cluster of village levels, and the Village Savings and Loans Association, um, having the couples curriculum, and then some of those couples go on to do activism, but structured linkages across levels to really have this enabling environment work, which is work with opinion leaders and uh, women's spaces, and also just doing more level advocacy at sector and district level, which is just a higher level provincially than the villages. Um, so one thing I did want to kind of pull out today, as I mentioned, I did draw on the fact that women's spaces, opinion leaders, and couples were trained. And these curriculums were developed by the program partners. Um, there was also support from an international consultant and also from what works to help develop these for this particular program. And one thing that we also supported with the research um, was to pre-test these curriculums. We rapidly pre-tested all of them over a month's time, and each session was observed, and then there were focus groups with participants separating for the couples, men and women, um, and then also interviews with either the RWN or RAMREC facilitators 
to just gather their assessment. This is a new innovative curriculum on how is the content, how are the exercises, how are the facilitation skills, um, and start to also think about what are some of the enabling both factors um, you know, that might support changing gender norms in IPV just to start to get people's initial sense of reaction and what might be some of the barriers to consider for this kind of work and content. Uh, this is one example of a training in the couples curriculum um, which looks at men and women's duties in a day in the house and then you place it out on cards and it's a really nice kind of visual representation of uh, household responsibilities on women and then used to look at discussion of roles and valuing that work. Um, all of the curriculums are very much participatory based um, and really um, you know, designed to foster critical thinking skills and reflecting on people's own experiences, um, their own kind of assessments of gender and power in their households and their relationships and in their communities. Um, some lessons I just wanted to highlight. I think these pre-testing, we all agree, was really helpful for us for the implementation and adaptation. Um, as I mentioned, we had added, you know, lessons learned that we were pulling from JOT, from SANSA, and so originally this curriculum was in English and then translated into Kenya Rwanda for the couples. Um, but the pre-test helped us realize certain translations or the partners realize it had to be better verified or clarified on certain, especially foundational concepts that were really important that people understood, such as things like the types of power or the difference between gender and sex. Um, we learn to kind of shift certain training times or cut down sessions to make them more accessible or seeing how far, how long they run or how short they run. And one really important learning was to have two facilitators for the couples curriculum, ideally a man and a woman, which was implemented. Um, and some of the reasons for this is, you know, to really, in a way, model gender equality for if a couples curriculum has both a man and a woman trainer present. Um, it allowed to support illiteracy. You know, many of the couples were, had, were illiterate, had quite low educational backgrounds, so if they had questions, particularly on areas that they may have to read or write, which was limited, but to still support that where needed. And also if couples or partners, if couples um, got emotional or needed time out during a session, to be able to adequately respond to that. So this was, I think, one of the most critical learnings from this pretest that was incorporated into the actual implementation of the curriculum. As I said, it is a participatory-based curriculum, and it also allowed practice for facilitators with this kind of management, um, which was, as we saw, very important to the success of the actual implementation. Um, I wanted to just pull out to how the What Works research has been working with the partners, and we've been working together to inform adaptation of Endashikira. Um, at the beginning of the program, we did some social norms um, vignette focus groups, having a scenario of a man and a woman, and then getting community members who were not beneficiaries, but just lived in some of the Indashikiro communities, to give insights on what is typical and what is common around gender rules, around kind of reactions to violence, causes of violence. And this social norms research has been used quite extensively to inform uh, both the content and the delivery of the community activism activities and messages um, throughout the kind of, as we've been developing that, the social norms research has been drawn on. We also conducted interviews with 30 couples and nine opinion leaders uh, directly before and then, uh, you know, several months after the training to assess their own impacts and their impressions of the training. And these key insights have been really helpful for us um, for things like refresher training for opinion leaders, which are ongoing, also for continued engagement of the oh, couples and community activists um, um, to understand kind of you know, what they didn't like, what they disagreed with, uh, what they really liked, this, you know, all of that is also used for the community activism response as well. Uh, we've also been able to use that to detail how the curriculums could be revised if they're scaled up. And some other research we've been doing is completed last year with 15 staff, both RAMREC and RWN staff, to assess their impressions and impact of the trainings. And we found that these were actually extremely valuable for the kind of on-the-ground learnings. 
Um, and we also found, not surprisingly, that staff could be more open about implementation challenges and beneficiaries, um, which I think really speaks, you know, because beneficiaries may be less open to critique a program they're benefiting from. So I think really speaks to the value of speaking to staff, especially with a kind of new and innovative program like in Industry Kirwa. Um, and another area that we've informed adaptation with the research, we've had some ongoing qualitative research with the women's spaces. So interviewing uh, women's space attendees, asking them how they heard about the spaces, why they attend, what they get out of them. Um, interviewing women's space facilitators, ask them what they've been doing and their um, if they have enough support, because they are women selected from the community, um, how their experience is as facilitators, and also just observing women's space activities, looking at the facilitator skills, the participation dynamics, and taking notes on that. And these findings have also been fed back to RWN and discussed and analyzed as a group to think about things like how to inform ongoing trainings for the women's space facilitators, of how to kind of equip and support them, and also look at its implementation challenges. So one example that came up was, you know, how to effectively engage men. Sometimes men are coming to the spaces and wanting to make sure that they are welcome there, uh, particularly men who are experiencing violence or wanting to learn more about rights, um, but also to really want to have a safe space for women. And some ob observations of women's space activities showing that when men were present, they might still dominate some of the sessions. So RWN decided to have things like a one day a month where men are invited and safely kind of attending, um, but to also make sure that there are dedicated days that are women only. So these are the kinds of lessons we've been learning from this ongoing research and verified by the partner's own m and &E as well, but that we've been speaking both between the research and the m and &E quite closely. We've also done some interviews and observations with community activists. Um, these are couples who were selected for the activism and then went through an additional training. So we asked them things about how their impressions of the training was, have there been any challenges with their activism, how is the community reacting to their activism, and these kind of insights we've um, fed back to the partners and discussed some of the challenges community activists were facing. One example I can illustrate is that some of the activists originally were saying that they needed to have buy-in from the village leaders. Um, so some of their more senior leaders have been trained by Nadasha Kira, but their village leaders might not be aware of this program. And so the partners then implemented village leader meetings to introduce Nadasha Kira and introduce objectives of the community activism. And this is just one example about how the program has been responding to this new kind of an implementation uh, and challenges that exist um, in the field that might not be um, seen in other contexts. And just to emphasize that all of these findings have been, you know, workshop by senior industrial cure program staff from CARE, Ardebon, and RAMREC, and their insights as well has really helped feed into analysis and interpretation of these findings. Um, so I just wanted to quickly show a poster um, which you can see the kind of example of how the program partners have adapted this kind of power poster from SASA. Um, one I'll just highlight in the top middle, you'll see a man and a woman carrying kind of um, branches on their on their heads. But in the Rwandan one, you see the woman with a basket on her head, more kind of appropriate to the context. And the partners spent a lot of time going through these and adapting this to the Rwandan context, what is normative, um, and you, again, drawing on some of what are these norms in Rwandan society. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've also been developing new messages that were not in SASA um, and new kind of activities for the industrial cure activism. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been looking at what are the kind of social norms in Rwanda and how can we draw on, you know, address social norms that might underlie violence, but also look at social norms that can be used to harness equality. Um, so for instance, at the moment, last year in Rwanda, a new law was promoted um, that now makes men and women equal heads of households. Before this, a man in the law was still technically the head of the household. Um, so how do we draw on these kinds of political legal shifts to promote um, kind of norms promoting equality? 
Um, there's also a lot of extremely progressive laws in Rwanda supporting women's equal access to property, and a very comprehensive gender-based violence law that the program has really wanted to make, raise awareness of through this, this program and through the community activism. And it's also spoke to couples really wanting a lot of uh, more details and interest and helped us realize that this was something that people could strongly relate to and wanted more um, information on. So we've been trying to develop that as well. Uh, we've also been looking at how we can better integrate some of, um, you know, cultural norms such as um, Kinyarwanda proverbs that can be used to harness the quality. Again, this would not be seen in another context. So how can we draw on uh, local cultural resources to promote this kind of work? And we've also been looking at what religious messages we can use that can be used to support gender equality. Uh, Rwanda is quite a strongly religious country, and religion was sometimes coming up through the curriculums as a way to kind of counter some of the um, lessons and learnings about gender equality. So we've been looking at how can we then draw on religious messaging that can be used to support equality. Um, and so a lot of our experience with the curriculum or the program's experience with the curriculum has been used really helpful for further developing the community activism. So that's just some examples of some further development that is ongoing. Um, I did just want to, before I wrap up, note, you know, adaptation, I think it's important to recognize as a skill. It's not an easy thing. It actually takes a lot of time and sometimes external support. Um, at Ambassador Kiro, a few of us were able to go to the learning um, office at Raising Voices by SASA to learn from them. There was also an external consultant who helped develop the curriculum and experience with SASA. Um, but just to really emphasize that it is something that is challenging. Um, a few kind of challenges I can just identify quickly was that, you know, especially to tailor a program like SASA that was in more one located community to a very widespread locations, many in rural areas, it was quite an adaptation for us logistically to consider. Um, I have, I've really just been talking about the qualitative component today, but there's also a whole accompanying randomized control trial as part of the works evaluation, which required us to have intervention uh, you know, areas, which are the couples that went through the training and also communities that experienced the community activism, but then control areas where couples who only go through the VSLA are members of the VSLAs and do not go through Ndashikirwa. But this meant that we had to be randomizing sectors. And this could be really just a challenge for distances between sites. And sometimes staff at the beginning were challenged by local leaders in terms of why were some districts or sectors chosen over another. Um, just to note, we did have a workshop with the field officers and supervisors to better understand this process of randomization, to practice even explaining this rationale to local leaders when this was identified as a challenge. Um, but it is something that was identified as a challenge quite early on. And I think overall, just challenge to really develop a clear, cohesive theory of change based on all these different multiple inventions, interventions, all of these different core components of why they worked, and this really did require time. And so with developing the theory of change, pre-testing the curriculum, and Dash Shapiro did have about a one-year inception period. So just to think about um, whether we are providing enough time for adaptation, and in our experience, it did actually take quite a lot of time. So to wrap up, I think some top tips and lessons learned from our experiences so far is the importance of, you know, planning program model and materials really catering to the beneficiaries that you are targeting. Um, and this really drew on the partner's expertise in their own areas of work. Um, identifying kind of key enablers or barriers to change in specific contexts. So what are the social norms operating? What is the legal framework? What is the policy framework? And how is that going to affect the implementation and the design of your program? Um, I think you can really highlight the importance of engaging research and programming and meaningful and ongoing collaboration. Um, there's been a lot of lessons learned and highlighted and shared across, and that's been something that's really helped I think, the adaptation process. I think also the value of pre-testing any new curriculum or program components before widespread implementation, and as I mentioned, the kind of valuable lessons learned from the pre-testing the curriculums, and then just to really emphasize allowing time for adaptation, um, given the kinds of complexities that can be involved. So that's all from my side, um, and I believe now we've got about 30 minutes for questions from you. Thanks very much.
So while we were waiting for people to come forward with questions, I had one about um, an adaptation around norms. Seems particularly challenging because you're going to be, um, as you said, in some instances, using the trying to um, call on positive norms or norms that will support the intervention, but at the t same time you're also trying to shift norms. So you're going to need quite a comprehensive understanding of the system, the normative, the norms in operation amongst that population. So more of a comment really. There is a question from Ariella Blatter asking if you have a slide with the theory of change, which I don't think you do right now, but perhaps you could go back to that graphic representation and talk through that a little. Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. I don't actually have um, a slide of the theory of change on the, the website, but I can add it um, for the one posted online or, or share it with you if interested. Definitely share that. It's quite, um, as you can probably expect, it's a lot of different pieces. It's actually hard to even fit on one PowerPoint um, slide uh, because it is quite a you know, complex, comprehensive theory of change that did take us quite a lot of time, or the program partners quite a lot of time to develop and finalize. Uh, but I'll definitely uh, share that with you. Great. So Thank we you. have a question on women's space activities. Can opinion leaders observe such activities in communities? Yes. Yes, no, they definitely can. And the program has really tried to encourage linkages between the opinion leader activities and the women's spaces and the community activism. So, for instance, couples might be invited to the women's space to testify about change in their life. Um, opinion leaders may refer people who are experiencing violence to the women's spaces and um, you know, they are uh, very much made aware of this resource in the community. So the program has really tried to strengthen those linkages. So thanks for that, that great question. I want to skip then to one from Miriam Hartman because it's specifically about the adaptation. I think there's a lot of interest in both the process of adaptation but also about um, the violence prevention side of things as well. But just to make sure we have a chance to talk about adaptation. She asks, she says she had a question about frameworks or models used to guide the adaptation process. Did you use one or even modify or adapt one to fit your process? Um, thanks for that great question. So we did draw on, you know, some of these kinds of principles um, that we presented earlier with adaptation. Um, but we didn't, as far as I know, draw on any particular framework or model for the adaptation process. You do give in the invitation and in and on the in the post on the website there is a link to a resource a reference yes. um, that people can download or read online and that gives I think some of the principles you used and is is something you'd recommend isn't that right Sarah? Yes, yeah, so in particular with um, identifying core characteristics responsible for change and some of those questions looking at the mismatch between the original program and the new program. So it's a quite a helpful resource um, with some of those principles that we tried to consider. That's great. Then um, if we can talk, um, go to Daniel White's question which is there's a fundamental issue with interventions on gender-based violence. How do you persuade men that it is in their interest to give up their power, if that's what you're doing? It's a really good question. I think the really positive uh, element of Indasha Kiro really drawing on SASA is looking at both positive and negative types of power and really looking at, you know, consequences of these negative types of power over, not only for the woman, but also for the man. Um, and the program really trying to get past even this idea that all men hold power and all women don't hold power. Uh, everyone has the potential to hold power within, or, uh, you know, kind of positive power, power to, to support others, and that we can all have power over one another, whether it's our children, whether it's our spouse, whether it's in our position as opinion leaders. Um, and so to really help people break down the kinds of, um, 
you know, I think we found in our experience, also drawing from SAMHSA, that this was a way to kind of think more com with the complexities of power and that it's not just always a power over, um, and it can be a real kind of tool to harness um, change we found, and I think SAS also found that. So I think it's a really great, great question. Another, I guess, a really good feedback from my colleague. I think something that was really appreciated from the couples was engaging men and women as couples, um, and actually being a, something that's quite r rare in Rwanda, and also incorporating skills so that people actually try things and maybe areas that they were not used to trying that they thought was taboo or something that they were not socialized to do, but actually through trying things, such as being more, spending more quality time together, for instance, um, learning and actually enacting some of the positive changes and some of the positive changes is for men for balancing power with their lives. Um, another example is, you know, sharing property decisions or sharing economic decisions when actually trying it, kind of firsthand experiencing the benefits of more balanced power, both in relationships but also in the household and for children as well. That's great. I think that whole question of ways of understanding power is really key and was obviously part of why the Sasa intervention was, was so effective, is so effective. Okay, so the question that we um, that that we were coming back to from Dr. Ali was regarding religious leaders. How comfortable mm -hmm. were they with the program, and how did you go about engaging them? So I think any sort of practical detail you can give or reflection on that process would be handy. Great. Um, now that's a, a really useful question. Um, what was great about going through organizations working with Rwanda Women's Network is their very well established work and relationships with religious leaders. Um, and, you know, we did find, though, um, as, as I mentioned in the last slide, that we actually want to be working more closely with development of messages to support gender equality that religious leaders can use. Uh, we had a bishop come to one of our uh, meetings on developing religious messages that can be used to support gender equality. We're also now working with a consultant to look at both verses from the Bible and the Quran that can be used for religious leaders to draw on and also for community activists to draw on as well. Um, and, you know, but it does, it, it kind of coming back to your earlier question about those community links with religious leaders that were built on by Rwanda Women's Network. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the church, or a lot of um, religious leaders and denominations in Rwanda are responding to violence. They are do become places where people go for violence, and it is something of, you know, a political agenda at the moment. And so to engage and invite religious leaders to be involved in this kind of work, I think, is overall something that law has been quite um, kind of on board with, and particularly those who have called with Rwanda Women's Network or within these community centers. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in how, how you actually went about this. Here is a question from Generals Nzeyemayana. What is needed in terms of human, time, and financial resources to get an activist able to conduct everyday activism? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, of course, the program like in Dash Akira, it's very resource time intensive. Um, as I mentioned, you know, 840 couples trained across the country, as well as about 40 opinion leaders per district and, you know, the women's space facilitators per district. So a very resource intensive kind of program. I think, um, you know, we're still in that process of really learning of how equipped these couples are to perform the activism. We're actually in the crux of the activism right now. Um, I should have really mentioned that the program, if I didn't mention anywhere, goes until next August. Um, the curriculum did finish last May, so we have been about a, almost a year in the activism. Um, but I do think, um, you know, we're still kind of learning about how much support and how you know, how kind of resourced they are as individuals to do activism. Although I think our preliminary insights really do speak to the value of having this kind of intensive curriculum that couples first went on their own kind of personal journey of change over five months um, and learning, starting to think about, you know, reflecting on activism and then having this additional training on activism for those who were really 
interested and um, kind of nominated to, to be activists, to continue on in this more formal activism. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think this kind of intensive approach, as much as it is quite resource intensive, we're finding is quite critical because it allows people to go on a kind of personal journey of change within their own household and relationship before doing this kind of work, but also emphasizing that they do require ongoing support and mentoring, and there has been quite regularly um, support, including uh, monthly meetings that Ramrat provides with the community activists, for instance. Um, I think just one other point to mention, we actually found that more couples than 25% wanted to be activists, which was something that we were quite surprised by. Um, and so we've also been trying to respond to how can we support those couples who were not formally selected or formally trained to go on to do activism activities, um, including uh, supporting couples to do activism couples. So for instance, if one partner of a couple went on to do the training and their partner who was trained didn't, they can still support each other in activism. Um, and something that we're finding in our just preliminary findings is quite powerful when people see couples talking about their own testimonies of change or what they've learned and actually, you know, doing activism as couples. So it's another area we're looking at how we can better support this ongoing program. Thank you, Erin. I think that's it's a really complicated area. Um, I'm skipping about a bit with the questions just to make sure we cover all, everyone gets a chance and that we're covering different kinds of questions. So here's another one. Beyond more progressive legal context, are there any fundamental differences in gendered relationships between Uganda and Rwanda? It sounds slightly like a thesis topic, but I don't know if you have any short version answers for that. I think some of the, you know, lessons that we've learned so far in adaptation um, is, you know, particularly with, um, as I mentioned, the example of needing kind of um, village leader and local leader support. I think Rwanda has a much more decentralized government um, where there's a lot more awareness of what is going on, particularly around dissemination, community advocacy, and how this um you know, relates to the to the government and the government's agenda. The government in Rwanda is very supportive of prevention of gender-based violence, but um, also, you know, ensuring that you have that buy-in of not just kind of higher-level leadership, but even village, local leaders is really critical in Rwanda. And that's something that, um, you know, might not be as strongly the case in Uganda. Um, and I think even kind of histories of community mobilization activities, it's not something that is used as regularly in Rwanda as it has been in Uganda in many different domains. So adapting kind of what activities look like in the setting um, and kind of how, how they play out has also been another difference as well. Um, in terms of kind of gendered norms, I think there are definitely a lot of similarities. Um, but as I mentioned, there's also been kind of many different differences that the partners have really tried to be attuned to in both the dissemination of messages and also in how the curriculum content um, and the activism has been adapted for this context. So that's just a few kind of examples of even the socio-political setting that are quite different in Rwanda. One question here is also from Dr. Ali. How sustainable is this approach or these interventions? And in Rwanda, you're just you're in the early stages, so it might be difficult to answer that. But you might have an idea. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important question and one that we're definitely um, wanting to be quite aware of with our um, evaluation as well, in terms of kind of the sustainability and viability of this kind of approach. Um, I do think you know having a quite uh, what was different from Sasa or other kinds of uh, community mobilization programs is combining this quite personal level intensive change, um, you know, supporting the community activists before those community activism activities take place, um, which I think for sustainability purposes we might find is more effective, but I think at this stage it really is actually quite hard to say how uh, sustainable these long-term changes will be. We're starting to actually do some ongoing research actually in a few weeks with couples one year past the training to look at some of the longer term impacts of this kind of work. Um, and my, my colleagues in the room are actually just saying though that the engagement of local authorities and opinion leaders is likely to have you know more implications for sustainability purposes. 
um, including kind of advocacy activities of there's what they call the Mexico, which is what different districts targets they need to meet each year um, on areas around gender, and the program has been feeding into supporting how they can do that. Um, and there's also the involvement on the Program Advisory Committee of Indat Shakira of Mijikrof, which is the Ministry of Gender and Family Promotion in Rwanda. Um, and so those kind of lessons being learned, as they're being learned, we meet with them quarterly or sometimes three times a year to feed back the learnings and findings um, and kind of um, equip their kind of understanding on best practices for violence prevention to disseminate more widely and incorporate. Um, so that's also just feedback from my colleagues on we hope will help, you know, the viability and sustainability. But as I said, we are still quite early on that it is um, difficult to give a kind of validated response. That's good, though. That's really useful. Then there's a question from Vandana Sharma. Some insights on how long the adaptation process took, which I think you mentioned you had a one-year inception phase, and also how many people were part of the pre-testing. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So the inception and adaptation took about one year, including the pre-testing of the curriculum, um, you know, randomizing the sectors, identifying the VSLAs, you know, recruiting all the couples and the opinion leaders, women's studies facilitators, but also just really finalizing, solidifying how the program partners work together and the theory of change. So it was um, like about a year process. Um, you know, and, you know, also looking at kind of best practices from the research as well and incorporating that into the theory of change. Um, with the pre-testing, so that's a great question. So there was, um, you know, two people from the What Works program. There was Kira Wanda, Ramrek, and our staff at least kind of a few there at each session, and then the RAMREC facilitators and RWN facilitators who actually implemented the sessions and practice implementing them were there. Um, so what they did was to make sure that each staff member had a chance to do at least one of the pre-test sessions. So essentially, all of the staff members were involved, actually, of Indash Shakira, as well as a few of the What Works researchers, um, even if, you know, it might mean one staff member just went to one or two sessions. Um, it, it, again, was actually quite a a resource and um, organizational intensive approach, but I think something that was so beneficial and also to give facilitators the opportunity to practice this new curriculum was something that when we interviewed them, they spoke about really appreciating as well to make sure that everyone was involved, for the supervisors as well, to really learn how people were responding, how they could be supporting facilitators. Um, it was quite useful to be so involved. That's great. I think this is a, a really important set of lessons learned about adaptation that people can draw from. Um, we have time for one more question, and this is from Zainab Gbobani, whose name I'm mispronouncing, apologies, who says, in some communities where we work in Nigeria, religious leaders are battling the cultural beliefs that women do not inherit. How does one engage with such cultural beliefs? So I think inheritance laws, and Suzanne speaking, inheritance laws are changing and are different in different places. Um, so this is kind of a sub-question to the earlier questions about um, how did you develop support among religious leaders. Um, so I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's interesting because it's also been a very relevant issue in Rwanda. Um, you know, there have been quite rapid changes recently that women and girls now have equal rights to property, what married women, girls can inherit, um, but it's kind of raising people's awareness of both the legal implications of this, about the value of this, and um, both with opinion leaders, but also with community members themselves. It's actually something that we even want to develop additional kind of um, uh, messaging around. And sorry, the the role of media as well to raise awareness. So we've also been, um, you know, I should have just mentioned quickly that Rwanda Women's Network has also been engaging the media in kind of disseminating some of these new laws, like the equal headship of household I mentioned earlier, things like, you know, rights to property and inheritance for women, and some of these messages that we develop at the community level. We've also been looking at both the political legal level, but also the media level as well. So really trying to work at many different levels um, of society through this program. Wonderful. Erin, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our hour. 
So um, I do encourage everyone to look up the the links online and read up the sort of background materials and to check in with our website. Erin, thanks again, and thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone.